classes, so that yeah, it's I am in my house. Okay, maybe we should chat. You should come one of these days. Yeah, just a second. And Alessandro, you're still in the mountains or you're? No, unfortunately, I'm back, to, I'm back to Marseille. Yeah, it's, I am in my house. I'm back to Marseille. I, I, I came back because we had to teach uh, in person and also because the kids are going to school. But since last week. No, you're yeah. still in the mountains or you're? No, unfortunately, I'm back to, I'm back to Marseille. Yeah, it's, I am in my house. I'm back to Marseille. I, I, I came back because we had to teach uh, in person and also because the kids are going to school. But since last week. No, you're yeah. still in the mountains or you're. No, unfortunately, I'm back, I'm back to Marseille. Yeah, it's, I am in my house. I'm back to Marseille. It's messed with I, sound. I came back because we had to teach uh, in person and also because the kids are going to school. But since last week. No, you're yeah. still in the mountains or you're. No, unfortunately, I'm back to Marseille. Yeah, it's, I am in my house. I'm back to Marseille. I'm back because we have to teach uh, in person and also because the kids are going to school. But since last it's week... No, you're yeah. still in the mountains? Or? No, unfortunately, I'm back to Marseille. Yeah, it's, I am in my house. I'm back to Marseille. I'm back because we have to teach uh, in person and also because the kids are going to school. But since last it's week, no, you're yeah. still in the mountains. Or? No, unfortunately. Um, hi, everybody. Yeah, sorry. Is that is this working now? Yes. Okay. There was some feedback with YouTube. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so we're live on YouTube and um, we are recording. So I guess we could start. It's about time. So yes, let me thank Alejandro for accepting an invitation to give us a talk um, titled Two Birth with One Stone, Discreteness, the Cosmological Constant, and the information puzzle. Um, so yeah, with this we can start. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm very happy to tell you these things. Um, some of you have heard this talk in, or pieces of it in different situations, uh, but I hope that there is a, an important part of this audience that they have not heard about this. Anyhow, there are some things I would say that I have not said too often. There is only two, 30 minutes, so I know I have to hurry up. So there will, be, uh, there, there will be some things that I will go very fast over, and I hope that we can talk about them later during this very long uh, discussion session. Um, okay, so I am very excited with these things. Uh, at some points, uh, there are uh, things that uh, work out very nicely. I will talk about these things, the things that work nicely. And there are many other things that are, you know, work in progress that I will not mention now, but I think, I mean, if in next months, I think we will have some interesting news about uh, developments that unfortunately, I, I mean, I was trying to hurry up to have something ready for today, but uh, unfortunately I cannot mention very much. Uh, okay, but so let's go into uh, the subject of the talk. So the idea is to investigate what are the possible uh, phenomenological consequences of one of the main predictions of uh, loop quantum gravity and other approaches of to quantum gravity that, uh, that from which we expect that uh, uh, the smooth, um, the smooth um, general, uh, mathematical description of general relativity uh, in terms of a smooth space time would be only an approximation of a reality that at uh, the fundamental level is actually discrete at the Planck scale. So the, the, this, uh, the origin of these thoughts uh, are, are very different in my mind. And one of the main motivation was the um, black hole information puzzle. But one of the, the things that, uh, one of the models that led to some quantitative calculations had to do with the cosmological constant. And so I will start by that, even though my, the information 
paradox was the initially motivating uh, idea in my mind. This is work in collaboration with Daniel Sudarsky, some things also with uh, Ed uh, uh, Wilson Ewing and Bjorken, James Bjorken. Uh, several aspects will be presented here. So the idea is that if uh, general relativity is only an effective description of a reality that at the fundamental level is discrete, like Davier Stokes is a, a, a description of, of fluids, we know that a generic effect that we, we would expect is uh, the presence of diffusion or uh, the possibility that uh, uh, energy leaks from microscopic degrees of freedom down to the fundamental or the uh, chaotic motion of uh, the fundamental building blocks of space-time or the molecules in the case of the fluid. So the generic effect is the apparent violations of energy conservation or the effective violation of energy conservation. Energy is not being destroyed or created. It's just that uh, it is going into degrees of freedoms that you are not describing in your mathematical model. And what I will, the first thing I want to mention is that if you think along these lines, then you can find a very natural way of thinking about the origin of dark energy from quantum effects. That doesn't mean that this is an explanation of what we actually, of what actually generates the dark energy that we observe in our universe, but it gives a possible perspective with very interesting uh, quantitative estimates that, uh, um, that match uh, observations. So let me start from uh, by talking about the cosmological constant problem. So uh, the cosmological constant problem is that we have a cosmological constant. There is a cosmological constant. It's extremely tiny. If we think naively in terms of vacuum fluctuations, then one gets uh, contributions from the vacuum energy of fields in our models of particles, which are way too big if we estimate them, estimate them very roughly and naively. Of course, the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor in the vacuum should be proportional to the metric, but from symmetry reasons. And but the problem is that it is divergent, and so if you put a cutoff, you get a very very large value. If this cutoff is of the order of the Planck mass, then you get something that is 10 to the 120 times too big in comparison with observations, and this is what people call sometimes the cosmological constant problem. So you cannot naively think of uh, the uh, cosmological constant as contribution from vacuum energy. And of course, all this calculation is very naive. On the one hand, is because it necessitates uh, renormalization, there are ultraviolet divergences. But on the other hand, is that any discussion of vacuum energy in the context of, the context of, of gravity ne needs, necessarily needs the introduction, I mean, the, 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 a, dis a discussion in a framework where quantum gravity makes, uh, 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 plays a role. We are talking, after all, about the way in which the vacuum gravitates. And so you see that this problem can be easily trivialized if you choose your effective theory of gravity appropriately. So in fact, the, and, and, and so in this slide, I just mentioned that there is a, a very old solution to this uh, cosmological constant problem, which is uh, in the form of unimodal gravity, which is a, a version of general relativity introduced by Einstein himself in 1919. Unimodal gravity, uh, he was considering unimodal gravity in the context of uh, models, of unified models uh, uh, in which he was trying to describe uh, nuclear matter in terms of uh, geometric, in terms of general relativity. Uh, uh, but the, the, the equations of unimodal gravity are just the trace free part of Einstein's equations which when you supplement them with the uh, condition that the energy momentum tensor is conserved is completely equivalent to general relativity. It's just the same theory up to one detail. And that detail is a crucial one, is that the, um, uh, the cosmological constant in this theory is not a universal constant that you put by hand like in the usual form of general relativity, it is a constant of integration. When you solve these equations, you have a constant of integration. That is the value of the cosmological constant. So the cosmological constant is one more of the initial data that you have to give to general relativity to, to, to unimodal gravity to solve the theory. So up to this detail, this is equivalent to general relativity. And the very important thing is that because the field equations are the tra trace-free part of Einstein's equations, then the vacuum energy problem I uh, mentioned before doesn't appear because, uh, and this was pointed out by Weinberg in, in 87 already. 
So vacuum energy does not gravitate in unimodal gravity. So in this low energy description of gravity, there is no cosmological contribution from vacuum energy. Unimodal gravity will play a role in what follows for another reason, which is very much related to what I just mentioned. So unimodal gravity is equivalent to general relativity, as I said, if you have to, because of two ingredients, the traceless part of Einstein's equations and the requirement, I, sorry, the requirement that energy is conserved, which is a very physical requirement. It's a very natural requirement that goes directly or that is linked to the fact that we describe uh, the gravitational field in terms of the sh of a smooth geometry. It goes to the fact that if you go to the uh, that the tangent space of any curved space time is Minkowski space time, and the isometries of Minkowski space time are directly related to the conservation laws that lead to divergence of T mu equal to zero. So this ingredient is directly linked to the assumption that a space time is smooth. With these two ingredients. Uh, we recover something that is equi equivalent to general relativity. However, if we lose ingredient number two, which is what we expect in a theory of quantum gravity where, where smooth geometry is replaced by something different at the Planck scale, then we get a natural uh, effective description of gravity, which allows for violations of energy momentum conservation. It's a natural description uh, of general relativity as an open system. Notice that we cannot lose this ingredient, ingredient number two, in the context of general relativity because the Bianchi identities imply this condition. However, if we replace Einstein's equations by the trace-free Einstein's equations, then this ingredient can be lost. And so unimolar gravity is a natural candidate to describe gravitation as an open system, to describe this possibility that energy can flow into this underlying microscopic degrees of freedom of quantum gravity. Another way of saying it is that if we go down to the microscopic scales, then uh, space time can no longer be well approximated by flat space time. We lose local Poincare invariance, and therefore there is no rational for uh, the rational that imply the conservation of energy momentum, uh, uh, the energy momentum tensor is lost. So, uh, so what happens if we violate the conservation rule for uh, T mu nu? So here I start from the trace-free Einstein's equations and I rearrange them so that I, I, I have the Einstein tensor here. Uh, so by adding and subtracting something, so this second line is just equivalent to the first line, but now I can use the Bianchi identities. So I take the divergence of this line and I lose this first term because of Bianchi identities, divergence of the Einstein tensor is equal to zero. And I obtain this equation, which links the gradient of the scalar curvature and the trace of the energy momentum tensor, this combination here, to the violation of energy momentum conservation that we could have in order to model this leaking of energy into uh, uh, the environment made of microscopic degrees of freedom. So I'm going to call this divergence of T mu nu the current of energy momentum violation. And the thing is that if this current satisfies this integrability condition, you can integrate this equation and replace it back into the previous line, and you obtain I, 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 you obtain um, an effective Einstein equation where there is a term, a dark energy term, which is fed, so which has a component that is the integral of this current of energy momentum violation uh, from some initial arbitrary reference point to the point where you are. And the, the path you choose to integrate is uh, irrelevant because thanks to the integrability condition, this term, uh, this integral is independent of the path. So if you don't violate energy conservation, then this term is not there. And lambda zero here is just the constant of integration as uh, from, from integrating this equation when you have a zero on the, on, on the right-hand side. If not, you have this contribution. So this is lambda, when you, satisfy energy conservation, then the cosmological constant appears as a constant of integration. When you don't, then you have a varying cosmological constant, cosmological constant that depends uh, on points on your space time, depending on your violation of energy momentum current. So the important thing is that this unimodal gravity is, is a natural, you know, uh, effective description of gravity 
that, as I said at the beginning, eliminates this uh, the cosmological constant problem or the, the, the most uh, drastic form of the cosmological constant problem, it turns out that it emerges naturally as a low energy limit in the th from the thermodynamical arguments of Jacobson, when often says that, I mean, when uh, these arguments of Jacobson that derives Einstein's equations from thermodynamical reasoning, in fact, often one says that this lead to uh, general relativity, but what actually these arguments lead to is uh, unimodal gravity. We can discuss this in the discussion session later. So unimodal gravity is very natural from this point of view. It is also very natural for any description of uh, quantum gravity where four volume, where there are 4D, four dimensional discrete building blocks where four volume plays uh, some, some, some crucial role. And that's another, another example of that is Sorkin's causal set uh, approach. Uh, unimodal gravity uh, diffeomorphisms are broken down to volume preserving diffeomorphisms and this breaking, this partial breaking of general covariance is what allows for violations of energy momentum conservation. Unimodal gravity is a natural semi-classical theory where when renormalizing the energy momentum tensor, this is also very nice. Uh, uh, we can discuss it later. If you do the renormalization of the energy momentum tensor in curved space times, you naturally are led to Einstein's equate to, to an, en an energy momentum tensor, which will violate conservation. In fact, you have to do an extra step if you want to get a renormalized energy momentum tensor that is uh, uh, satisfying the divergence of T mu equal to zero. If you don't do that step, you get the violation of energy momentum conservation that is compatible with integrability conditions of unimodal gravity. If you put this into equations of unimodal gravity, you get a very simply the same equations that you would get by doing this extra step in, 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 you don't need to do that extra step. And in particular, something that is often said that curvature introduces the, uh, <clears throat> the um, trace anomaly in renormalization of T mu nu can be, uh, can be transformed into a diffeo anomaly. One can think of the trace anomaly not as a violation of scale invariance, but rather as a breaking of diffeomorphism down to volume preserving diffeomorphisms. So in the renormalization of T mu nu, unimodular, unimodal gravity emerges also naturally as the effective description of this or the semi-classical description. Unimodal gravity is such that vacuum energy does not gravitate, as I said, and apart from differences in the dark energy sector, unimodal gravity is completely equivalent to general relativity, it passes absolutely all the tests of general relativity. There are two local degrees of freedom, gravitational waves are just the same as in uh, general relativity. Uh, observations by LIGO will be exactly the same, nothing changes. As long as we conserve energy, of course, uh, diffusion effects could produce some phenomenology. And this is the, 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 the thing I, I want to talk about, one of the aspects I want to mention. OK, so, uh, so we got interested into this. And the question we, we, we stated is, can we predict the amount of diffusion from general arguments in uh, quantum gravity? If we could, then we would have a model that would predict how much dark energy can be produced via this type of mechanism, via this diffusion mechanism. And so, uh, so I want to quickly mention about uh, uh, this uh, <clears throat> mechanism or this model that we came, that we constructed. Okay, so we know that, uh, right, that this granularity that is in the back of our minds when we think about diffusion effects is not something that we can think as uh, some fixed lattice like uh, the molecules in the in the in the case of a fluid that pref that select the preferred frame. There are arguments which I, which I, con I consider very strong that imply that if you violate uh, Lorentz invariance in the way that it would select the preferred frame then relative corrections will make them grow and you would get huge violations of, of uh, Lorentz invariance at, at low energies, which we don't observe in the lab. So this discreteness is something that cannot be visualized as a, sit, as a lattice sitting there, at least in the situation where space-time is flat. However, these arguments that, uh, these no-go arguments that work in flat space-time, they could, uh, there is a loophole in those arguments, which consists of 
which, which has to do with situations in which there is curvature. If there is curvature, then curvature, there could be Lorentz violating effects appearing due to the presence of curvature. The cartoon picture is the one you see here. So imagine a surface made of tiles in regions where the surface is flat, then you don't see the presence of tiles, but the discreteness in the tiles becomes more apparent when you have curvature and failure of, you know, you know, the edges of these tiles become more apparent when you try to, to describe a curved surface. So it could be Lorentz violated effect, violating effects, which are um, you know, modulated by curvature. And if that's the case, then the no-go theorem I, I mentioned before, no-go argument I mentioned before fails because you, these quantities could percolate to low energies, but it would be modulated by the presence of curvature and all tests of Lorentz invariance in particle physics are basically made at low curvature. So another idea that uh, uh, it's in the back of our minds when we think of this discreteness is that uh, this discreteness has to be something that is realized in a way as, uh, uh, <clears throat> so discreteness in geometry has to be something that we uh, understand in the language of Dirac observable in a relational fashion, like geometry in general relativity makes physical sense only when you introduce it, a set of test observers with the rulers and clocks so that the notion of geometry can uh, have an operational meaning. So because of diffeomorphism invariance, coordinates have no physical meaning, components of the metric have no physical meaning. If you want to extract geometric meaning, you need some auxiliary structure. Test observers in the classical theory, Dirac observables in the, in the quantum theory. So, uh, so from there, it follows that in order to probe the, scale, the Planck scale, one needs to think of degrees of freedom, you know, which are the analog of the clocks and the rulers in this picture here. So they have to be degrees of freedom fields. We think of fields that will interact with this granularity and eventually diffuse energy into it. The fields that will primarily interact with this are those which are able to see it in the first place. And so they need to be degrees of freedoms that break scale invariance themselves. They are degrees of freedoms that carry uh, clocks and rulers with them. And so scale breaking degrees of freedom are those which are uh, you know, detected by the scalar curvature through Einstein's equations. So the scalar curvature is proportional to the trace of the energy momentum tensor and the signature of the presence of degrees of freedoms that break scale invariance, uh, massive degrees of freedoms. Uh, typically, is the non-vanishing of the trace of the energy momentum tensor. So that means that the scalar curvature is the natural mean field manner of describing uh, the presence of the right degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom that are able to interact with the uh, granular structure. In other words, if you have massless degrees of freedoms, uh, scale invariant degrees of freedom, such as photons, then the intuition is that there is photons do not carry because they are, they are massless, there is no natural rest frame associated to photons with respect to, with respect to which the Planck granularity would make sense. While for a massive degree of freedom, there is always for each excitation its own rest frame with respect to which this um, discreteness can be realized, can make an operational meaning, can have an operational meaning. So how do we proceed? Now we imagine a test an otherwise test particle, we start with, from a particle that would be otherwise free, and we parameterize a force due to the interaction between a particle and the uh, granular structure of space-time. So here we write the four acceleration of this test, otherwise test particle. So, uh, so this is the four acceleration. And so, because we want this, uh, force, this friction-like force, a force that would be due to, due to diffusion into the granular structure, uh, to be uh, non-trivial only for matter that violates scale invariance. So we say scalar mat uh, scale invariant matter does not suffer nor sources frictional forces. So this force has to be proportional to the scalar curvature on the one hand and to the mass of the excitations. And then simply from dimensional analysis, this this expression comes out. Let me explain it a little bit. 
So what you see here is the spin of the particle. So we are thinking of a fundamental particle with its spin. The spin is the only intrinsic direction that the particle carries that is automatically orthogonal to the four velocity. Acceleration has to be orthogonal to the four velocity from just the kinematics of special relativity from the fact that four velocities are normalized to one. So the force has to be proportional to the spin and its magnitude is proportional to the mass and the scalar curvature from the arguments I just gave. And then dimensional analysis tells you that you have to put mass Planck square on this side. And then we need to put this sign, which is the only way in which this force violates in, a, in some sense, Lorentz invariance. It does not really violate Lorentz invariance because, uh, okay, so what is this force? What is this sign term here? We are thinking of this as being applied to a cosmological setting. So matter fields, which are made of these particles, select the preferred frame, which is the co-moving frame in cosmology. We're gonna apply the inmodular uh, gravity we're going to apply our model to the cosmological setup. So there is a structure associated to, there is a preferred frame associated to the one selected by the matter fields uh, at long scales in our, in, in our universe, which is this vector field of co-moving observers, psi, and u here is the four velocity of the particle. So this term here is the sign of the inner product between the spin of the particle and this preferred vector field, which is selected by the matter around this particle. And in this sense, this selects a preferred frame, but which is in, in, in at the same time selected by the surrounding matter. This term here is the one that makes this force a non-conservative force. This term here is the one that turns this into a Langevin-like equation, into a friction-like force. And you see that when you compute the way in which the energy, the mechanical energy of the particle changes along the trajectory of the particle, if you do that, then you find these two terms. This term here comes from our frictional force. And the second term is just something that you naturally have, which has to do with the failure of this co-moving frame field, uh, uh, co-moving field to be a killing field. If the space-time would be stationary, this term wouldn't be there. So we know what this term is in cosmology. This term tells you that the energy of the particle will change due to redshift. So this term is well understood. This is the new term. And, for, and this new term would have a definite sign if alpha is positive, a definite minus sign, thanks to this sign term here. So this is why we put this sign term. There are other alternatives for this, but the uh, <coughs> implications, the, the phenomenological implications in order of magnitude for what I want to say next do not change. So very quickly, so there is this frictional force on what type of particles it acts. And I like this uh, geometric picture very much. So if you, uh, so this force will be non-trivial only on massive particles with non-trivial mass spinning particles. So only particles that have mass and spin will feel this frictional force. And this is quite nice because if you think first of a scalar particle, particle without spin, even if it had mass, this force wouldn't be there, but a scalar particle is a one dimensional excitation in a sense. If you think of it as a probe of the geometry of space time, a scalar particle is given by some word line in a four dimensional space time, which a single direction, which is a four, the direction of its four momentum. Now, if you think of massless or scale invariant excitations, they are three dimensional probes because they are transverse, because they are massless, so you have the basically can be seen as ribbons if you want or three dimensional so hyper ribbons in space time. One direction is their form momentum and there are other two directions in which you have uh, where the polar polarization vector leaves. They are transverse excitations and therefore only three dimensional probes. The particles that are affected by our frictional force are massive and spinning. So these are the genuine four dimensional props of the space time geometry. Uh, because in addition to the four momentum, you have a transverse three dimensional space, the orthogonal space where the spin of the particle can, can be. And so from this- Alejandro? Uh, yes. Um, there is a hand raised by Laurent. I don't know if he would like to ask a question afterwards or it's a clarification. 
It was just a technical question. Like here, you show the evolution of the velocity. Um, do you have an equation that for evolving the spin too? Yes, 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 yes. I will talk about that e equation later. Of course, this equation has to go be supplemented by an equation for the spin, so that the whole thing would be, uh, you know, would make sense. I didn't write it. Okay. So, so in the paper we, you have this equation. Yeah, sure. Because the spin has to remain orthogonal to u, and so there is a non-trivial equation associated to the spin. Yes, thank you. And I will come back to that when I talk about some interesting possible phenomenology in a moment. So the equation we introduce is very much like uh, it has some, uh, it's very natural and appears in different contexts. It looks like the Papa Petro Dixon equation that describes the motion of a spinning body in curved space times. It also looks like the kind of things that you find in W. Uh, KB approximation when you study the trajectories, you know, that follow fermions, the solutions of the Dirac equation in curved space times. And uh, it's also an analog of the Langevin equation that introduces diffusion uh, because of its diffusive uh, character. So now we are ready with this idea for a friction and a phenomenological force for particles, we can now uh, investigate what would be the implication for uh, the energy momentum tensor of an ensemble of particles in thermal equilibrium. We, we are interested in thermal equilibrium because, or in a situation where we are close to thermal equilibrium, namely this, this uh, diffusion will have to be very small so that we don't, this doesn't drive us out of thermal equilibrium. If we're close to thermal equilibrium, then thermal equilibrium is, is interesting because that's the situation that uh, idealizes well matter in cosmology. I forgot to say that there is this alpha in our force. In this alpha is just a dimensionless constant that if the model is successful, we have to be order one in when we make predictions. So from simple relativistic kinetic theory, once you know <coughs> how uh, the force, the friction acts on a, a single particle, you can do kinetic theory and find what would be the diffusion uh, associated to an ensemble of particles in thermal equilibrium. So what would be the violation of the energy momentum tensor, uh, the conservation of energy momentum tensor. And what you find from a very simple calculation is the following. So you find that J, this current of violation of energy momentum uh, conservation is given by this expression where you see the temperature the scalar curvature appears, and you get the sum over the species of particles that you have in your ensemble, species, particles in the standard model, weighted, it's a sum over the species, where you have the trace of the energy momentum tensor of each one of the species. Not surprisingly, the trace appears because only massive particles violating uh, scale invariance contribute, weighted with the spin of each of the species. And the whole thing is proportional to the only natural direction that you have in cosmology, which is the co-moving uh, vector field. Now you can do a very simple approximation of this expression and take the, the, the species that, uh, that contributes the most to this sum, and that would be the one that has the, most ma the, ma the highest mass. So you can approximate that by the top quark uh, contribution. And if you do that, then assuming that the top quark also is the one that dominates um, uh, uh, the scalar curvature in, 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 in early cosmology at high temperatures, then you find this expression, which is a simplified one. You don't need to do this approximation, but having this approximation in mind helps uh, understanding a very simple estimate that follows. Okay. So, so we have in this approximation that the current is extremely simple. It is proportional to the square of the scalar curvature in the direction of the co-moving frame. So we can now calculate the contribution to the cosmological constant or to dark energy from this diffusion mechanism. And so assuming that initially the cosmological constant is zero, and that's an important assumption in what follows, so that this constant of integration I mentioned at the beginning is zero. So cosmological constant initially for some reason is vanishing. Then because 
and assuming the standard model is correct, and then only at the electroweak phase transition, massive and spinning particles first appear. And so this diffusion is turned on at the electroweak transition when the temperature of the universe is about 100 GeV. And from there, the cosmological constant grows fed by this current. And so you can do the calculation by using the standard model of cosmology. So this is just a calculation. You can calculate this integral. This is the integral in the top quark approximation. You can actually use the exact uh, you know, formula. It doesn't make much of a difference. But for an estimate, believe me that if you do this uh, calculation, you will find that the result is proportional to the mass of the top to the fourth. This is not surprising because uh, the scalar curvature goes like mass to the top to well, I mean, I can explain where this comes from, just trust me. The thing is that you get a mass to the, of the top to the fourth time the temperature of the electroweak to the third, because the mass of the top is of the order of the electroweak transition temperature. This goes like the temperature of the electroweak transition over mass to the seven, over Planck mass to the seven times the Planck mass square. And this factor happens to be 10 to the minus 120. And this is how this mechanism produces the cosmological constant of the right order of magnitude. There would be an alpha all around here that I forgot to write. So, but here you see from this rough estimate that you would be able to explain the observed cosmological constant produced by this diffusion by simply tuning this alpha to something that is of order one. And here, this is what you see. So uh, these are different values of the temperature of the electroweak transition. There are some uncertainties about where the electroweak transition happens. If you take this into account, then you see that for various values of the electroweak transition temperature, here you see what are the values of alpha that you would need to choose in order to uh, produce a cosmological constant, which is exactly what we observe. And you see that for this very large range of electroweak transition temperature, you always get an alpha, which is about order one. And this is what is exciting about this, this model. Another thing is that this model produces very quickly at the electroweak transition, the cosmological constant that grows very quickly due to this diffusion and saturates very quickly to something that is effectively a constant. The reason is that the current goes like a scalar curvature square. As the universe expands, the scalar curvature goes to zero very quickly. And so this integral dies off very quickly. And this is why the cosmological constant in spite of the fact that there's always a friction, this frictional term is, becomes very quickly negligible. And uh, the contribution to the cosmological constant is effect, uh, effectively vanishing and you get an effective cos uh, constant. Now, uh, we had to assume that the cosmological constant was zero to begin with. Now, we think, and uh, these are, this is work in progress that I unfortunately have, I'm not ready to talk about well, I can mention some aspects of it in the discussion. I, we believe that the very same uh, perspective allows also for understanding why is it that initially the cosmological constant would be vanishing. Namely, this perspective of diffusion also offers a possibility for mechanisms of re relax a relaxation of an initially very high cosmological constant, the cosmological constant that at the very beginning, I mean, near the Big Bang could be of the order of Planck scale, but relaxes to something that is basically zero by the time of the electroweak transition. So we believe that we, are, we should be able to come up with uh, an argument that will remove the assumption that we are making so far that the cosmological constant is initially vanishing and that this mechanism produces it completely from zero. Now, this perspective also offers the possibility for thinking about an evolving cosmological constant in late times of the universe. And that would be very appealing, especially from, so as some initial investigations show with Ed and, and, and Daniel, for the so-called H0 tension. There is a mismatch between the values of H0 measured from CMB uh, observations and measured from local uh, observations of supernova. Uh, if you would have uh, a change in cosmological constant in the recent history of the universe, this, uh, this could explain this mismatch of observations. Of course, you would need some new channel of diffusion to be turned on around here, because as I said before, 
the model I just showed you predicts that very quickly after the electronic transition, the cosmological the dark energy becomes virtually a constant, and this diffusion channel is too tiny to make any uh, important change to the future evolution. However, a possibility that we have been considering, that we consider with Daniel, I mean, there could be other channels that are open, other channels for diffusion in the late part of the evolution of the universe, and asking yourself, what is it that happens later after the CMB that could explain this, or what could open a new channel, something that seems like a natural um, possibility is to consider black holes. We know that black holes have singularities inside. We know that quantum effects are important for black holes. They are thermodynamical objects. They have a huge entropy. We explain this entropy. We hope to explain their entropy and their thermal uh, features by invoking uh, Planckian fundamental degrees of freedom. It could be that the presence of black holes, which first appear, assuming that there are no uh, uh, astrophysical uh, uh, black holes, I mean, which first appear after the CMB has been produced, after the nonlinear gravitational in effects of gravitation produce structure, produce stars and galaxies and black holes form, there could be, there could be some effects that I will mention uh, in more details in, in what follows that could open a new challenge for diffusion that could again change the cosmological constant in the recent history of the universe. So uh, this, I will go very fast over this. Maybe there will be questions later. These are just pictures that show that very uh, simple phenomenological models for how the cosmological constant could change in the late history of the universe could actually uh, you know, uh, make uh, resolve or alleviate the H0 tension problem. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna describe this in any detail. I will go quick, more quickly because I imagine that I don't have a lot of time left to this black hole friction phenomenology that I just evoked. So, uh, and uh, so more details are given in this paper with Daniel that is out since uh, last year. And I mentioned uh, this in a talk at PI last year, some of us, some aspects. Some new ideas have come to my mind, to our minds here and recently now, especially preparing this talk. And uh, I think these are potentially very interesting things. Of course, it's phenomenology. Of course, all this could, I mean, we don't know if this is right or wrong, but phenomenology is always interesting because it could open our eyes towards possible new observations. So. Uh, the statement I want to make is that uh, something that is well known, uh, the area of a black hole at fixed mass is maximized when the spin of the black hole is zero. So a Kerr black hole has less entropy than the Schwarzschild black hole with the same mass. And this is a very intriguing uh, statement. Uh, so of course, spin, uh, spinning black holes uh, in classical GR the spin of a black hole is conserved. And this is due to axial symmetry of the solution of Einstein's equations. Due to axial symmetry, uh, the spin cannot change. And uh, the stationary spinning situations are, uh, spinning solutions are Kerr solutions where the spin is always the same. Now, what if this is just an approximation? And in fact, from loop quantum gravity or approaches to quantum gravity like loop quantum gravity, it should be an approximation and exact axial symmetry might not be realized at the fundamental level. If that's the case, then some friction-like effect, the possibility of losing energy in rot rotational energy into the granularity, the granular of the fundamental structure of the theory should be there. And this would naturally open a channel for spinning black holes to maximize their entropy and become Schwarzschild black holes, as this entropy formula suggest. Um, Eugenio has mentioned uh, aspects of this, but what uh, in concerning primordial black holes, he was thinking about interactions between the black holes and the surrounding uh, thermal uh, matter. But what I am talking about here is something well, uh, in, in spirit similar, but I am thinking of the interactions of the space time with the fundamental granular structure that could open another channel for uh, for uh, diffusion in which the spin of a black hole will slow down until the black hole becomes uh, 
uh, Schwarzschild black hole. So we have investigated that by writing phenomenological equations with Daniel. And so you can just parameterize how the spin would change. And this comes to your question, to your point, uh, Lohong. Uh, this equation here would be, uh, the blue part of this equation would be the type of equation that you would have to write in that would be compatible with the force I wrote for a fundamental particle. But for but a fundamental particle, let's say ele an electron, has spin one half, and the magnitude of the spin cannot change. So this second term wouldn't be there. But a microscopic object like a black hole, then this second term can be there, something that is proportional to the spin, and it would produce uh, spin diffusion. Now, uh, assuming that this effect would be, uh, you know, modulated by the natural curvature uh, scale around the horizon of the black hole, which is given, you can come up with different concepts. All of them will give you more or less the same thing, the Kreshman sca scalar close to the horizon or the trivial, you know, curvature, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, scale that you would find from the, from the Schwarzschild radius or the radius of the black hole, then by parameterizing this term like this, then you find that this diffusion effect could be actually, um, well, it would, would be an interesting uh, possible way in which uh, uh, the energy, the spinning energy of the black hole could be diffused into, into the fundamental degrees of freedom. Now, if you, <laughs> If you put a, a, a coupling of the order one here, you find something that is very natural that the uh, black hole will spin down in a, in a fraction of a second. So, so which is what you find here. The, the, the lifetime of the spin of a black hole will be extremely tiny. Now, if instead you prop okay, if instead, because this is, you, you don't need this to be order one now, you're talking about the macroscopic object. So, you can now evoke other possibilities which are not to, uh, which are very natural as well. So you could say that this beta is modulated by the number of Planck units that you need by one over the square root of the number of uh, quanta that you need to produce this black hole, this macroscopic object. So these are natural numbers that you would get from statistical, from some, from some stochastic process. Uh, one over square root of numbers of, of quanta. And if you put this type of couplings, then you start finding more interesting uh, numbers. So I am a bit tired. I'm not sure if I'm being clear, but uh, we can discuss this uh, more detail in a moment. You find lifetimes for spinning black holes which start being very interesting. For example, you would find that if you have a coupling that is modulated like this, uh, it would be suppressed by one or the square root of the number of quanta that you need to make this microscopic object. Then you will find that the lifetime of, a, of an extremal a spinning black hole, which is what you expect to form from astrophysics, would, be, would, would go like this. This is one over 158 billion years times the mass of the black hole divided by the solar mass square root. So it mean, this means that uh, a solar mass black hole, which is extremal, will last, will be spinning for about 10 million years. And you can easily see that a supermassive black hole would basically spin for many, many ages of the universe. Only small black holes will slow down quite uh, quickly, but not too quickly uh, anyhow. So 10, billion, 10, 10 million years for a solar mass black hole and, uh, and more than that for any black hole uh, of higher mass. And something I wanted to write, but I didn't have time to, uh, because I've been considering this idea. And I think it's, 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 we would like to, I mean, we have ideas about how to come up with a, with a quantitative model in which we could calculate this, is that if there is friction and the energy in the rotational energy of the black hole can go into uh, uh, the granular structure, two things can happen. One thing that we mentioned in this paper is that uh, we have a new channel for diffusion, and this would, uh, this would feed a new growth of the cosmological constant. So if you would know the population of black holes, the spectrum of black holes from the CMB to today, you would be able to actually estimate how much energy you lose into uh, the cosmological constant and how much the, the cosmological constant would grow. Uh, and this would 
uh, have uh, obvious, uh, this will have observational consequences and possibly relevant for uh, the HC retention. But this would have also astrophysical implications. In particular, it would, it would make uh, low intermediate mass black holes, most of black holes that are left alone, 10 million years is nothing for a solar mass black hole, would basically be at rest. And we know from observations of LIGO that all the observations that we have made so far are compatible with having collisions between black holes with zero spin. So this could be a mechanism that explains why is it that most black holes that we observe seem to be charged black holes when astrophysical mechanism for the production of black holes should produce highly spinning black holes. But another thing, which I, which is not, all, all this is mentioned in that paper, but one new thing is the following. If you have friction, if you have diffusion, and you have a system that has natural frequencies, then you can excite uh, vibrations. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, violin, violin uh, string. If you have a violin string, when you, uh, when you, when you, <coughs> uh, play the violin, uh, actually you are uh, making, you know, the diffusion into the tiny, in the molecular structure of the, of, of, the, of the string ends up being amplified and you end up having uh, uh, the, the, the string um, vibrating in, the nat in its natural frequency. So if these effects are there, then it, it would be natural to expect that you would excite the quasi-normal modes of these black holes while, while these black holes are slowing down. So one possible prediction of this would be that there is, uh, there is a very long lived ring down due to the diffusion of spin into, uh, into the Planckian regime. And some very rough estimates, assuming that, this, uh, that the energy that goes into, into this ringing would be a small fraction of the available energy, which by the way is a lot of energy, you have up to 30% of the rest mass of the black hole, uh, when the black hole is extremal, about 30% of the mass of the black hole is uh, stored in spin. If a tiny part of that goes into the, this ringing that I'm talking about, with present sensibility, we might be able to see this tiny black hole slowing down. In a, my estimates assume that 10 to the minus four of this energy is being radiated in, in the form of, of, of these uh, gravitational waves. You could th see things around 300 parsecs around the Earth. So 300 parsecs is a reasonable portion of our own galaxy where many black holes could, I mean, and you would need newly formed, you need many things. You need newly formed black holes of reasonably small mass with high spin that would be slowing down. So you need to catch them in this time, in, during these 10 million years, if there were uh, solar mass black holes, why they're slowing down and they are emitting this, this uh, signature of, of this friction, this tone that would be a gravitational wave at the uh, frequencies of uh, quasi-normal modes. How much time do I have, uh, Marius? Well, we're past the time by 20 minutes. <laughs> ah, you never told me. Okay, so... Um, yeah, okay, maybe I should stop. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that if this, if we take seriously this underlying granular structure predicted by loop quantum gravity, then there is a very simple resolution of possibility for the resolution of the information paradox, which is that when pairs are created in Hawking radiation, one goes outside as thermal radiation and the correlations with the one that fall inside that carry the information are transferred to the Planckian uh, structure. And so at the end of the day in this Sigma three, what would purify the Hawking radiation would be correlations, not with field theoretical degrees of freedom, but rather correlations with the de defects at the Planck scale. And uh, this idea is hard to, to test uh, at the moment in our loop quantum gravity theories or theories of, of quantum gravity in full detail, but we have been able to show that this is actually uh, the case. This is exactly what happens in models, uh, like uh, like in quantum cosmology, in, in these papers with Lautaro.
So in quantum cosmology, we can actually construct the model. This is not an explanation of anything, but it shows that this idea actually makes sense, at least in these simple toy models of quantum cosmology. And so, uh, so I think I'm basically done. Let me quickly go over this. I'm sorry for, the, for going over time. So violations of energy conservation in effective most exceptional generality can occur due to Brownian diffusion with applied and microscopic environment. Such diffusion produces dark energy in unimodal gravity. And a mesoscopic model of this diffusion with test particles uh, feeling this friction like force produces a cosmological constant of the correct order of magnitude. If diffusion energy can be transferred to matter from matter to dark energy sector, then if some other channel will be turned on later, I talked about this possibility of black holes, then uh, maybe these ideas could have something to say about the HCL tension, but there would be a much more rich, richer phenomenology as I tried to hint. There are uh, these black holes slowing down, slowing down in their spin. There is also black holes slowing down in their orbital motion around central galaxies. There could be implications for the formation of supermassive black holes, etc., cetera, in, in galaxy formation. So, uh, and finally, discreteness at the Planck scale could explain also the fate of information in black hole evaporation as these models in quantum cosmology show in a quantitative form as, uh, and as uh, pictures that one can draw at the level of black hole evaporation also suggest. This mechanism avoids, we didn't have time to talk about that, maybe we can discuss, avoid, in my opinion, all of the drawbacks of all other possibilities, mainly those that have to do with uh, energy conservation, uh, precisely. So the, 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 the fact these two things are related because I mean, on the one hand, as soon as you allow, if you think that these these films are real then you should have diffusion, you should be able to lose energy into these degrees of freedoms. And, and as soon as you can have diffusion, you should also be able to, to have correlations due to interactions that are established. So both the information, uh, so this, this whole, discussion is relevant for, for these two aspects, for information and for diffusion at the same time. And so with that, I will stop and let's go to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, yeah, so the commentator for today is uh, Ding, Ding Jia. Mm, yeah. Let's, we are, uh, the, the talk lasted a bit less than an hour, so we're going to have to be a bit faster in the discussion, but we still have time. I uh, think, would you like to? Yes, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for this uh, very nice talk. I liked uh, your uh, um, your pictures and drawings uh, a lot. Uh, they, they really help with the understanding. So I have two questions. One, uh, very important. The other one is less so important. So could you go to the slide? Uh, uh, where you define the Xi field? The, the, uh, the, when you talk about um, the uh, equation of motion for the um, massive and spinning particles. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, this one? Read this slide. So the important question is, uh, what is the dog doing there? What is the what? The dog. Ah, the dog. <laughs> Uh, so, um, okay, the dog, <laughs> no, nothing. The dog means, I mean, uh, the dog, maybe uh, it was supposed to be self-explanatory. Maybe you see the dog is in the desert. There's a lot of wind. So uh, the dog was there to, <laughs> to, uh, to, you know, it's just a funny picture that reminds us that this sign term here is the one that introduces diffusion that makes this force into a friction-like force. So the, the dog is under a lot of friction with the wind, as you can see on the... And this, this has to be a spin, spinning dog. It should be a spinning dog, you're right. Yeah, yeah I, I should look for a spinning dog on, on Google <laughs> Images. <laughs> uh, and uh, the less so important question is about uh, 
I hope to understand the, the logical structure of your ideas better. So uh, the, in, the, in your title, you introduced three concepts, uh, discreteness, uh, the cosmological constant problem and the information uh, puzzle. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I suppose the discreteness is the stone and the other ones are the birds. Yes, that's right. Uh, so it seems to me uh, in the presentation of your talk, you introduce some other um, important uh, um, notions. For example, unimodular gravity where um, this uh, conservation of energy doesn't hold. So let, let's say conservation of energy is another uh, important notion. Mm -hmm. Then I uh, think on this, on this slide, you have uh, some equations that describe how uh, massive spinning particles move. Mm, yes. Or model. Uh, so let, let's say these are uh, say dynamical equations. So now we have five concepts. Now I, I wonder um, what the logical structure is among these concepts. Is there an implication like discreteness implies something or uh, non-conservation of energy implies something and then that leads to a solution of cosmological constant uh, problem, et cetera. So what's the logical structure behind these important yeah, concepts? Yeah. So the, lo the logical structure is the following. We saw that these are the equations of unimodal gravity. If you violate energy momentum conservation, then you will have something in your effective Einstein's equation. So these last equations here are just equivalent to the thing you started with, plus the assumption that energy momentum conservation is violated. If you have that, then you see that energy that would be lost from matter, the release of fields into the discrete structure would feed a cosmological constant term here. Now, that's the first statement. Now, this friction force that I introduce here is a model for the way in which matter interacting with the granular structure will, would lose energy. Once you have a friction-like force, here you see that when you look at the mechanical energy of a particle, this particle will slowly slow down due to the interaction with the grains of space-time. So this particle will slow down until it's it's completely at rest with respect to the uh, co-moving frame here in cosmology. So when this particle stops with respect to the co-moving frame, then this u, the forward velocity, will be, uh, will be aligned with the co-moving frame. And when the two are aligned, the spin of the particle, which is always normal to u, will also be normal to psi. And this term here will vanish. Of course, this is an absolute value. Yeah, the absolute value of zero is zero. In fact, one could regularize, well, this is just a technical detail. So we introduce a model that allows for particles to lose, to slow down due to friction. Like in, in your bike, if you stop pedaling, eventually your bike will stop if the terrain is flat. Where is this energy going? This energy is going into the molecules in the air and in, 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 in the atoms on the ground due to friction. Here, Part, test part, particles in the standard model in cosmology will also slow down due to this frictional force. Where is this energy going? Instead of going into heat, according to these equations of unimodular gravity, this energy, this energy would go into feeding dark energy. The energy lost from the motion of particles will produce dark energy, will produce a cosmological constant. So once I give you an equation that tells you how a particle loses energy, a single particle, then I can calculate how an ensemble of particles, so many particles in the universe lose energy, and calculate this current of violation of energy momentum conservation and actually calculate, quantitatively calculate, how much energy is lost from these particles moving in space-time when they interact with the granularity. And we, and we know that all this energy would feed this cosmological constant. So, the friction produces violations of energy momentum conservation that in turn produce a cosmological constant. Is uh, it uh, correct? Uh, and, and, sorry, Ding, if I may interrupt, Alejandro, I'm a bit confused here. So mm -hmm. uh, you do not assume energy conservation. Uh -huh. I'm trying to understand where this energy goes, whether it disappears or not. And I thought 
it would basically disappear and become something else. Uh, but now it seems to me that you're saying that if I put the dark energy in the picture, the cosmological constant, I have again conservation of energy. Is that correct? Yeah, if you if you, you can redefine T mu nu here by yeah. including this term. And so if you define the T mu nu bar or T mu nu tilde that contains this uh, second term, then that T mu nu tilde would be conserved. But this T mu nu tilde contains a term that has nothing to do with the matter around. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But you're right. One could, at the effective level, talk about a new T mu nu that contains a dark energy component, so a component that has the equation of state of dark energy uh, that restores energy conservation. So, but it's they, not coming from you from know, your matter fields. No, it's from matter fields that you know what they are. Okay, yeah. Right. So the cosmological constant can change from place to place according to this model. That's right. The cosmological constant could change from place to place. But in the context of cosmology, if you apply this to, co to cosmology, because you start from a matter distribution which is homogeneous and isotropic, then your cosmological constant will change only in time, in co-moving time. So it will not change. I mean, when you apply this to the universe, to the local universe, the, new, the universe as such as, as we see it, when you assume from the beginning homogeneity and, and isotropy, then uh, you would get a cosmological constant that is homogeneous and therefore it will depend only on time. But the formalism allows for a cosmological constant that would be a field, yeah, that would depend mm -hmm. on, on space time points. So for example, there would be more around the spinning black hole as it's transferring the ah, spin. That's a good question. Not yeah, that's, a, that's an important question. Uh, <clears throat> All this works if you satisfy the integrability conditions. Okay. Ah, okay. So, uh, if uh, you satisfy the integrality conditions, then you can go from here to here. Okay. If you don't satisfy the integrability conditions, then uh, your unimodal gravity is not a good uh, effective description of what's going on. Okay. Now, in the context of cosmology, Precisely because of homogeneity and isotropy, this integrability condition is satisfied trivially because everything will depend only on T. And so you have one form that depends only on T, then it's automatically an exact, a closed form, okay? Now, for the black hole, then we don't have homogeneity to protect us. And we, so one would, one would have to be more, careful about uh, describing this diffusion mechanism. However, at the cosmological level, if you think of very large scales and you have some homogeneous and isotropic distribution of black holes, okay? Mm -hmm. Then they would, at, that, at those scales, then the integrability conditions will be satisfied again. So as long as you make statements about cosmological scales, you will be safe. However, I must say that close to a black hole, for the moment, these diffusion effects would produce deviations from general relativity that we have no idea how to describe. That perhaps, uh, I'm not saying that there, there is no way of describing them. I'm saying that it's not obvious that uh, unimodal gravity will be sufficient. I mean, at the level, so this integrability condition is really uh, an important, an important um, requirement. And uh, we only know how to satisfy this requirement at the moment at cosmological scales, invoking homogeneity and isotropy. Okay, thanks. Um, Can I think? Uh, maybe you have sorry, I think uh, we should leave the time for the, uh, the, the general audience to participate. Okay, so the discussion is open. Somebody. Can we move to uh, the page 37, please? Um, can you turn on your video on, please? Yes, why not? Hi. Yes. Uh, 37. This is 37, according to me. You uh, mean yes. the number down here? Yes. Yes. I mean, when you have said that uh, 
the black hole lose their spin, uh, lose their spin because, because they rotate simply. I mean, not only black hole are concerned with that or just them. Any, I mean, if we, uh, if we take as a classical vision. No, we, we have a discussion in this paper. I'm sorry, I, I, I just took, I just took pieces of the paper here. We have a discussion in the paper of why is it that for stars, neutral stars, then uh, the effect is actually uh, very tiny because you have to consider those. In relation with quantum effect, but gravity. Uh... So uh, the point is that uh, uh, a neutron star or some object, rotating object made of matter, then the effect that will, uh, that will be important is the one given by uh, the contribution from, from the matter, from the particles that, that produce uh, this, uh, this, this object. Now, uh, uh, there is no singularity, there is no... Uh, we, we are saying that black holes are different, if you want. But as soon okay. as you have a black hole, you have a horizon, and you have this intriguing yes. uh, if. fact that uh, the uh, if the initial state of uh, of care black holes produced astrophysically happen to have too too low of an entropy in comparison with the state of a non-rotating black hole, and so okay. we are speculating. This is this is obviously a speculation. We are speculating with the possibility that because at the fundamental level, axis symmetry is only an approximation because of discreteness in quantum gravity, that uh, this deviation from exact rotational invariance should imply that uh, the possibility of spin not being conserved and that this would be a natural channel for this entropy imbalance to be re for, for entropy balance to be reestablished, okay? okay? Yes. Uh, you don't have th this, th uh, uh, when you have a neutron star, you don't have a horizon, you don't have an entropy uh, of this type, uh, you have uh, the matter that makes the neutron star. And so what you can do instead is to, and this is what we do in the paper, you can actually use our equation for the particles that make up the neutron star and when you calculate how much they would slow down, you find an absolutely uh, irrelevant, uh, tiny yes. effect. So, so let's neutron stars yeah. would not slow down. They would slow down, but too, too but very little for for any possible any other uh, rotating uh, object. Yeah. Uh, if we stay in the black hole case. How this influence the Hawking radiation? If we take, if an example, two this uh, two black holes which have the same mass but have different spin, did their black hole uh, Hawking radiation uh, be different? Well, this is one. This is actually one of the channels uh, by which black holes actually lose angular momentum, right? Uh, so the Hawking radiation uh, particles will, will are emitted with angular momentum, and the angular momentum goes down sufficiently fast so that the so that the so that the black hole evaporates without ever becoming extremal okay so this is one of the channels by which the black hole actually starts uh, you know um, losing speed. Lose the energy the, the speculation here is that it could be an unexpected uh, channel that you don't see from simple what, what is Hawking radiation Hawking radiation is something that you predict when you combine general relativity with quantum, quantum field theory, theory yes. we're saying maybe from quantum gravity, the fact that we're thinking that uh, uh, at the Planck scale, uh, you know, the smooth description is only an approximation. Maybe this is offering, you know, fresh uh, phenomenology that so far we have not considered because because we often view uh, things from the point of view of quantum field theory and general relativity only. So here is some, something that naturally uh, you know, emerges from thinking about uh, discreteness as a key, as a key aspect of, of, of reality, as predicted by, by loop quantum gravity and other approaches to quantum gravity. So of course, ideally, what we would like to have is a-, is a Something that can, we can measure. 
and, and have an argument, which is a, a, a calculation from the fundamental theory. But the fundamental theory is not mature enough for doing this calculation. So at the moment that we are speculating and we are proposing phenomenological possibilities, yes, which, uh, which, is, which is not to be neglected. Uh, uh, this could be, this could very well be wrong but one has to explore these things because if, because it's by exploring this type of things that sometimes there are new hints into, you know, the thing. New, that, new physics. Yeah. So maybe a lost. Uh... So so let me just mention. And, and the assumption here is, if you if you put a coupling that is order one, then you get an effect which is way too big. So it's completely incompatible with observations. The black hole in the yeah. center of the galaxy would just stop. Uh, and there wouldn't be spin, and we have direct, we have indirect evidence that those black holes are spinning, and so order one couplings don't don't work. Now, uh, these couplings could be suppressed by one over square root of n factors, which naturally ap appear in 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 uh, in, uh, in stochastic uh, situations where there are many many underlying degrees of freedoms involved in a macroscopic object such as. And this is exactly the case for a black hole. So if you put one over square root of n type of uh, couplings, then you get more interesting uh, effects. If we, if we suppose that we observe uh, the decreased spin of a rotating black hole, did, uh, did this will be a hint to, to say that loop gravity is... Uh, correct. Why not, yes, correct. No, no, I don't think so because because this is not tight in a in a clear it's fashion. Not directly linked to the theory. loop quantum gravity. It, it would say that something about the assumption of the existence of these uh, building blocks is right. It would say that yes. that something about this uh, underlying multiplicity of microstates is correct, which is something we expect. Not only loop quantum gravity is a, makes a clear prediction about that. But it's something that we expect also from general arguments, right? I mean, when we see the entropy of black holes being proportional to the area, so uh, this naturally suggests the existence. When you have a huge entropy, you, the first thing you think is, where is this entropy coming from? And, and immediately what this entropy formula suggests is that there are a lot of underlying microscopic degrees of freedom. So, we expect these microscopic degrees of freedoms to be there. We don't understand their precise nature. Loop quantum gravity provides a possible, uh, you know, uh, structure for these underlying uh, fundamental building blocks. But it could be that this is more general. I mean, there are reasons to expect this yeah. from very general, uh, very very yeah. general. Not restricted to loop quantum gravity, yes. Um, so the, the quantum, quantum gravity is a very difficult problem. So it's very important to look for the problem from different angles. One yes. angle, which is the, the one explored by approaches to quantum gravity, such as loop quantum gravity and others, is to apply some reasonable recipe for quantization and try to see how far you can go. But another angle is to look for phenomenology. Right? Planck did not understand very much anything about quantum theory when he proposed this model for, uh, for black, uh, black body. Black body, black body radiation. radiation. So making some phenomenological prediction that turns out to be, to suggest something possibly observable is interesting in itself. And it could be give hints that help, you know, the construction of the theoretical framework also. You know, like, like talking about Planck again, then Einstein came and, and explained the photoelectric effect and quantum theory started. Yes. Uh, great. Um, may I suggest that uh, we stop sharing the screen, Alejandro, so that we can see you too? Uh, you don't see me when, I sh when we share the screen? Uh, we don't see your video right now. Ah, that's good. But it's customary to switch into a person-to-person -person discussion. OK, stop at sharing. This point. And now you see me, I hope. Do you see me? No, you don't see me. Now no, you. No. Now we see you. Uh, there is uh, mm. uh, somebody called uh, Munia, if I pronounce it correctly. 
Uh, you have to unmute. Yep. That's not actually my name. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Um, do you want me to ask the question that I asked on the chat? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I know that you're talking about different scales, and I know that you're talking about the special nature of black holes once they become um, very small. But the two questions that I want to ask is related to one, when Hawking talks about um, antimatter and matter, when these particles um, appear across the event horizon where one falls and the other escapes, um, is it still non-locality in terms of the properties of the particles? Uh, uh, are you saying if I am invoking some kind of non-locality in this friction effect? Uh, I, I, I did not quite understand you. Of, of course, there is non-locality in Hawking radiation. There are these correlations between what goes out and what goes to the singularity. Yes. Uh, so, so, that would, so that would basically mean that they are entangled across the event horizon, which basically means they are the same object in two different places. So it really wouldn't matter whether one was able to escape or not because they're still entangled. The information on one would be attached to the information on the other. Now, I know you wouldn't be able to change the polarity. On I'm not contesting that. In fact, in Hawking radiation, uh, yeah, they are not the same particle. They are, they are two particles and they are uh, in an entangled state. Uh, the quality of the sound is pretty bad now. I'm not sure, are you all? Uh, I can hear you, but it seems that uh, this person uh, lost connection. Okay, okay. So maybe I can continue answering. So in Hawking radiation, there are these correlations, which are important for the problem of information. And, uh, and there is no locality associated to this process. One of the particles falls immediately into the singularity, the other goes to infinity. And so one of the particles hits the Planckian regime very quickly, and the other one goes to infinity. So this non-locality could play a role in understanding the possibility of this spin friction that we are talking about. And why is it that black holes are different from neutron stars, say? Why is it that black holes slow down and not neutron stars? Well, black holes have a singularity inside, and so there is this non-local connection between the outside and that singularity, which, which could open a direct channel to uh, for diffusion into the Planck scale. So this non-locality is, is present in our intuition when we can't come up with these models. But as we read, uh, as we read about uh, black hole, we, when we talk about horizon, we said it's not, uh, it's, it's nothing. I mean, it's not a real, uh, uh, it's not a physical uh, object, I mean. Uh, well, it depends. From the outside, it is. It is the boundary of the region from which you cannot escape anymore. It is very hard to, you cannot locate it. It's a very elusive thing, but... Uh, we don't hit anything when we, have, when we are in horizon. I mean, uh, but, as, we, that's as true. we can read about it. That's true. I don't contest that. If I fall through the horizon, I don't feel... It. Well, I do feel things when I cross the horizon. In principle, um, I cannot locate what the horizon is. I could locate what an apparent horizon is. So horizons are hard to talk about, but it doesn't mean they don't exist. There is it's a physics. It's a space it's like apparent that. Horizons it's, 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 it's or not. Because if you want to think of a hypersurface as being something existent or not. Anyhow, I am talking about the space-time as a whole. And, uh, and I am thinking of the horizon or the apparent horizon as something special, maybe in my estimates, because the curvature scale at the horizon plays a role. But uh, I am not literally thinking of the horizon as being something we're thinking about the whole space-time with spin and the possibility of violating spin conservation simply because the space-time is not um, axisymmetric. 
So using scales that are proper of this space-time, like one over the uh, Schwarzschild radius of the, of, the, of the black hole, is a natural thing to put in the phenomenological description. That doesn't mean that I am associating to the horizon some reality that it does not have. But one, 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 that, that makes me think about some, some things that we are considering as possibilities for exploration. You know, there, are this, there is the membrane paradigm that, that produces some uh, features of black holes, uh, black hole physics, where you assume some kind of reality of, uh, of the stretch horizon or the, or the apparent horizons. And, and you see that uh, many features of black holes can be modeled by, by this paradigm. Uh, it would be interesting to explore uh, this, this, this uh, physics of, um, of the membrane paradigm with the view that there could be diffusion effects that are, uh, you know, uh, motivated by quantum Planckian effects. And that would be an interesting thing to explore. We haven't done that yet to go you know, one step further from this very phenomenological model about uh, slowing down of the spin of black holes that we have published in that paper. Is there a question by somebody else? Alex, I have a question regarding uh, violation of Lorentz invariance, uh, because this is a part that is not clear to me. You were mentioning um, at the beginning of your talk that uh, in fact, uh, uh, violations uh, are uh, in your model are something that is uh, expected when you have curvature. So if you try to observe a violation in absence of curvature, the effect would not be present. Yes. Uh, but, but then, uh, of course, there are, uh, there are a number of, I mean, there are uh, dozens of different uh, uh, tests of Lorentz invariance, uh, but there are also those that uh, are cosmological tests. And for instance, I think of, uh, um, the tests that are based on uh, uh, propagation of uh, uh, cosmic rays uh, on cosmological scales. This is one yes. thing. But also, I have in mind uh, other cosmological tests, namely, if you have a violation of Lorentz invariance, you will also have uh, a modification of uh, the Mukhanov Sasaki equations in cosmology. Yes. yes. And, uh, there are very strong constraints uh, on Lorentz invariance given by this. Uh, so then I was wondering, because you were said also that uh, mm -hmm. your cosmological constant, uh, effective cosmological constant appears later, not immediately at the beginning of the universe, but if I remember correctly, maybe at... Uh, at the electron uh, transition. Yeah, so is it is it that before you don't have uh, Lorentz violation and therefore we don't see the effect uh, in the cosmological perturbation? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, our... The violation of Lorentz invariance that we have is modulated by the scalar curvature. So you, you see the force, remember, the force is proportional to the scalar curvature. So if you think of if you think of Lorentz violating terms that could appear in particle physics due to this force, due to this effect, then they will have to be uh, modulated by the scalar curvature or powers of the scalar curvature. And so the dangerous uh, Lorentz violating terms in, in an effective Lagrangian of particle physics are those that are dimension four or less, because those that are dimension, higher dimension, they are just uh, suppressed by the Planck scale and they are so tiny that, that uh, they would pass all the tests of Lorentz violation, okay? So the dangerous one are the other ones. And so if you try to construct dangerous uh, operators that will be modulated by the curvature, you find that there is nothing you can write because, uh, because the curvature already comes with one, one, one over L square dimension, okay? And so to write dimension three operators, in, in our, we, we, we write this in, in other talks, I, I show this. So if you construct the, the possible Lorentz violating phenomenological terms that you could have due to our uh, mechanism, you find that uh, the only possible ones are higher dimension. And, and they produce violations which are completely uh, uh, so tiny that no test of Lorentz violations can, can, 
can can get close to that. Okay, so we pass this model pass all the tests as far as I know. Okay. So I mean, logically, you expect it, it, not to have any violation. Sorry. On the phenomenological level, nothing changes. So you don't expect this violation to be big enough to be That's right. observed. We do an estimate. So you do, you do have a few terms, but they're very tiny because of the presence of the scalar curvature. And so in order to, to, to get to, you know, there, there are papers by Kosteleksky where he uh, puts bounds, puts bounds to the, to uh, what he calls the, extended standard model. It's a standard model with all possible Lorentz violating things that you can imagine. And from different experiments and observations, they put bounds to all these different couplings. In order to get close to, to one of these bounds, we would need, uh, we would need, I don't remember the numbers, but we would need uh, densities which are much, yeah, yeah, I, I do remember. We would need densities which are comparable with, uh, you know, densities of the universe at the time of grand unification. For, at the time of grand unification, the R, the scalar curvature of the universe would be sufficiently big so that these Lorentz violating terms would be sufficiently big that we reach the bounds that we put on the lab to this Lorentz violating. So, uh, well, uh, uh, so this answers a little bit your question. But another, another comment on your question, photons, which are, in uh, in uh, in the cosmic uh, in this uh, gamma ray burst, photons would not be affected by these uh, Lorentz violating terms also because photons are massless and scale uh, invariant, so massless particles don't don't feel this effect. Um, this is unfortunate because having something that could be tested would be would be nice. Uh, is uh, is uh, yeah. Another thing that can be said, I mean, there are violations of energy. This effect that produces the cosmological constant is extremely tiny and is depressingly tiny. <laughs> when you look at what happens, so uh, at, the, at the moment of the electroweak transition, which is the moment in which this diffusion is maximal, you produce a cosmological constant. But if you calculate how much energy you have invested into producing this cosmological constant, so delta rho, let's say, divided by rho at that time, so how much energy density has been gone divided by the energy density that you had at the time in which the effect was maximal? Delta rho of a rho in one, delta rho in one Hubble time of a rho is of the order of 10 to the minus 50. So something like of the order of 10 to the minus 50 is the amount you have used to create the cosmological constant, which is completely irrelevant at the moment. But because it is a cosmological constant from there on, when the universe dilutes, eventually becomes the dominant, uh, the dominant term today. So you create something that is completely irrelevant at very long time ago, but because it remains as a cosmological constant, it becomes important today. So this, is, this gives you some intuition as how small this, these effects are and how hard it is to find fi phenomenology today in, in normal densities or, or, or neutron, neutron star densities or nuclear densities. Uh, all these effects are, are very tiny. But if black holes would open a new channel, then, then there would be hope. These estimates for black holes are very, very interesting because you do get observ possibly observable effects, like this spinning down or some deviations from Newtonian trajectories of black holes in galaxies. All these things um, are possible if if the diffusion is op channel is open again by black holes. Um, hi, Alejandro. Uh, I have a I follow up question: That can can you understand this violation Lorentz invariant from the from the canonical point of view? I mean, in terms of uh, deformation of constraints algebra, because you know this can be related to all the issues that we have in, in these effective models. Where yes, I have I have no idea. I haven't looked at that. At so that it would be all. very nice to understand uh, how you can break the constraint algebra to. But, to this, make is, but, but this, you, this is happening on the matter side, right? As, yeah. In order to understand, in order to get 
to some fundamental description from from the food theory, what would need to include matter into the into the game, right? I mean, all yeah. this idea that you need uh, scale breaking degrees of freedom around uh, you. So ma matter plays a very important role in all this. So my intuition is that I mean, when we say scale breaking degrees of freedom, would see this granularity. What I have in mind is if you had the full theory of quantum gravity, you have uh, geometric degrees of freedom and matter degrees of freedom. Now you need to construct Dirac observables as out of relations between these things, observables that detect that some, you know, you have to construct physics out of relationships between matter and, and so the very old problem of Dirac observables in, in the full theory. Uh, only via such approach, you will realize that not all matter degrees of freedoms are the same and that uh, massless or scale uh, invariant degrees of freedoms don't see this granularity at first and only scale breaking degrees of freedom see it. All this will have to be phrased in terms of Dirac observables that include the relations between geometry and matter. So, so it's quite complicated. So that's why I don't know how to start. Uh, uh, so you're talking about the constraint algebra, it will certainly have to, in, maybe this is a possible avenue, but it will certainly have to involve uh, not only the gravitational constraint, the, it will have to involve the Hamiltonian vector constraint, you know, the constraints with matter, with some matter model. Um, Alejandro, so, so it's super interesting. And we try to make a more general thing so that we also maybe get on board the people that are not so familiar with these concepts. Um, th there is something I cannot get my head around on how you are thinking about it. So if you don't understand the question, uh, let me know, I rephrase. Uh, what I cannot get my head around is the following. I remember also from all the discussions with you, you had this idea of a pre-geometric decrease of freedom being able to be excited. So before you think about, you just think about somehow graphs um, and information being stored in there. And I have the feeling that this is uh, also what is behind uh, all this. Um, now, there is somehow energy that is being closed. It's being stored in this uh, scalar, which is mysterious. And we say it has some phenomenological. Only at the phenomenological level. This this uh, right. this uh, dark energy is a, is a low energy effective description of what we should describe at the fundamental level. Right. right, but you started the talk by saying, uh, you know, in quantum gravity, I have degrees of freedom that are not going to know what space and time is. And so they're not going to know what energy is because if you don't know what time is, you don't know how to define energy. Sure. Um, so there is some interplay that is happening there. These pre-geometric degrees of freedom are getting excited. And what you see phenomenologically is some sort of energy coming out. And that is the step that I, I don't understand how to imagine how this happens. No, or, not, yeah. I don't know if you have some intuition. I'm not, I mean, but it's not the energy level of equation it's was clear, but I don't it's, see, it's, you know. it's not energy coming out, it's the opposite. So I, I am riding my bike down the slope, or no, on, on a flat land, and there is wind. I stop pedaling. Where is all this kinetic energy going? Yeah, it's going in degrees of freedom that can uh, be excited in terms of energy. That's where. That's right, that's right. Okay, but here now I, you're saying it's going into the of freedom. If you, want, if you want, every time I say energy, you have to put quotation marks around my energy statement. I am just saying, if you want to be precise, I am just saying that divergence of T mu nu need not be zero. That's all I'm saying. And this is very precise in, in, in the general relativistic context. Mathematically, and, sure, yeah. And, uh, in, and if divergence of T mu nu is mathematic, okay, the mathematics is clear. Now the words uh, have to be, one has to use some words, one has to talk about what's going on. Let me, let me, let me try to use an example. Divergence of T mu equal to zero implies, doesn't imply that energy is conserved. 
in general relativity. You know, it implies that if you have a very tiny region, everything that enters there comes out. At the very tiny, in the local, it implies energy conservation at the very local level. If I consider, if, I, if let me follow my example, you will see where, I, where I'm going. If you consider now a, a, an extended region, then when you define, you have to define energy precisely because of what you're saying. You need some observers to define energy. So you need you consider a family of observers going through this region, and you define the energy, uh, the four momentum density seen by these observers from the T mu. Nu. And now, when you calculate the divergence of this current of energy momentum as seen by these observers, you find that the divergence is not zero. In fact, in this, the flux of energy on some finite region in general relativity, as seen by observers, need not be zero. It is on, so energy is not conserved, it would seem. It is only conserved if these observers follow, uh, if the space time is so special that there are time translation invariants. If there is time translation invariant, then energy is conserved again. But when in a generic space time, this family of observers will say, we have so much energy now at the beginning, and at the end they have less or more. Where is the energy going? Well, there is no precise way of saying where the energy is going, but the energy is going to gravitational waves. But as you know, in general relativity, there is no T mu nu for gravitational waves. Because of diffeomorphism invariance, you cannot write any local expression that, that encodes uh, the notion of gravitation, energy of gravitational waves. Only asymptotically, where you have additional structure, you can talk about the energy carried by gravitational waves. But locally, because of the failure of the conservation I'm talking about, you know energy is going somewhere. And the explanation is matter is doing work into the gravitational field. And so energy is being lost into the gravitational field even though I don't know where this energy is going because I cannot describe it, describe it precisely, the physical intuition is correct. When you have a dynamical space-time, energy will go from matter into, into gravitational degrees of freedom at the global level. What I am saying here is exactly the same thing, but at the ultra-local level, I am saying at the global level, at large scales, energy can, can, can be lost in gravitational waves. At the tiny ultraviolet scale, energy can be lost also into something that unfortunately, for a moment, I don't know how to describe, but energy can be lost in principle for the same reasons. Because if I don't have a smooth geometry, then, I mean, divergence of T minu equal to zero is a theorem once you assume that space-time is smooth to all scales. If, if space-time is not smooth at the Planck scale, then divergence of T mu nu cannot be zero anymore. And so even at the local level, energy will not be conserved. Where is it going? It's going to degrees of freedom. It, it is going away from uh, my effective description. And it's a, it's a role of quantum gravity to explain where this energy is going. It's not going to be called energy. It's going to be much harder to talk about uh, intuitively about it. It's already complicated to talk about the energy content of gravitational waves, as I said. We don't know what it is. If you are in a completely arbitrary space time, you cannot characterize energy of gravitational waves. You don't know what, en you know that you can send gravitational waves, but you cannot measure uh, locally what, what amount of energy you have. So things, when we advance in, uh, in, in physics, uh, some concepts that are very familiar to us, that are very useful for intuition, might just disappear. And so when I talk about uh, this energy, you have to put these quotation marks. As, but it's, not, it's nothing new. It's just like in the classical theory of general relativity, but through an ultra-local channel in, instead of a global channel. Great. Thank you for the explanation. And so now my uh, very vague attempt to, to see if you, what you're thinking about information. So, okay, there is a difference there, right? That in the gravitational waves, you cannot define the energy in the generic situation, but you know that uh, that's what happened. Um, in what you're saying, you said many times something is lost. Um, and I guess information is lost. And what I'm wondering is if you're thinking of somehow quantifying, mm -hmm. I don't know, seeing how big the, this um, cosmological constant is going to be, 
with respect to how much information you lost. So if you can translate this uh, ah. effect in terms of information. Yeah, you want some contact with information. Yes, we do have some, we, we, we can do that. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, in, the, in some of my talks. Uh, I'm not sure if it's in the paper, but you can easily calculate how much entropy uh, you have created through this diffusion mechanism. Ah. Uh, yeah, and, that's, uh, was... that's, that's directly related to entropy. And uh, the, the statement is that you produce a very tiny amount of entropy. So in, uh, in the usual, so in most, most of the time in the cosmological evolution, entropy is constant. There are some moments in which entropy jumps when, when some processes happen, but when, 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 when you're not, uh, when, when, when the number of species in thermal equilibrium is constant, then entropy is basically constant. This uh, diffusion produces additional entropy, and you can compute how much. It's not very hard. Uh, I cannot tell you. <laughs> I, I don't remember the, the numbers, but uh, but it's easy. You, you have the first law, and there is a source to the first law uh, that that produces entropy due to this diffusion. This is entropy but from you the matter fields. You, you can translate. I mean, you have energy that is in thermal equilibrium, leaving the system, right? Because you have a divergence of even So you have a, de a, a delta Q. You have heat leaving the system. And so you from, because you are in thermal equilibrium, you can actually calculate. It's like a thermodynamical system where you have opened a, a hole and, and some things are, are falling out. So you can calculate how much entropy you, uh, you are producing through this. Can now, so uh, let me just finish the could you comment about this. Then another aspect where information is important is in the black hole evaporation. And there it would be great to be able to quantify how much information is lost through a mechanism of this type. Unfortunately, nobody knows how to describe a space time that, uh, with the evaporating black hole for the moment. So I mean, it's a challenge. You have to think about it hard, very hard, but everything seems to tell you that uh, having a very a precise quantitative estimate is, is, is out of reach at the moment. However, in this uh, cosmological setup, when you have evolutions across the, 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 the Big Bang singularity, then things are much easier. But you're dealing with, you're dealing with toy models. And there, in these toy models with uh, Lautaro and with Hongwan, uh, we, are, we were able to actually compute entropy production, uh, so information lost across the evolution through the Big Bang in a quantitative fashion, whose physical meaning is hard to evaluate because you're dealing with the model, not with reality. In this quantum cosmology, systems you know, are very nice, but they are too simplistic to, to capture uh, what you really need uh, for quantitatively resolving the issue of information in black hole evaporation. Black hole evaporation is a very hard thing. You need to think about particles, matter, geometry, all that very close to the singularity because the singularity is essential, as we know. We know these Hawking partners, one of them falls into the region where the new physics of quantum gravity is absolutely necessary. And so there you have to do quantum gravity without any symmetry assumptions with matter, without assuming that you have pure gravity, it's very, very hard. But uh, the, the example of um, cosmology shows that, that this is a very natural channel for information to go. I mean, it's, to me, it's obviously the most natural way in which information, this is how you, this is just how it happens all the time in physics. You have systems with many, many degrees of freedom and they are waiting to be excited. This is how uh, the second law of thermodynamics works. As soon as you reach, you interact with too many of them, then you, you correlate with them. And if you want to talk about unitarity, you better don't forget about those degrees of freedom. And in all the discussions, most of the discussion, people 
to forget about these degrees of freedom. We, in Loop Quantum Gravity, we know these degrees of freedom exist. They are part of our fundamental approach. So we cannot forget about them. And if we don't forget about them, it's obvious that uh, at the singularity, they will, we will establish correlations with them and we have to take them into account to explain where information goes. And because there are so many, it's kind of evident that there are enough for purifying whatever you want. Because they are much more than anything that you can imagine because the Planck scale is so small in comparison with everything else. Thank you. I think there is Daniel that wants to ask something. Yeah, I just wanted to make two, two small comments. Uh, one regarding uh, this um, uh, issue of, uh, mentioned by Francesca of the possibility of having effects at the cosmological uh, scale. The things that we manage to see are, go up to things of the order of Z, Z equal 10 or something like that. And that means that the universe, by the time the thing was, you know, emitted, was perhaps, you know, 10 times smaller. And that would mean that you have enhanced the, the, the curvature produced by matter by a factor of 1,000. That is very, very small enhancement compared with the, with the you know, tiny value of the curvature of the universe today. So, so, so you are going to still be very, very, very far away from being able to see, uh, uh, you would need Z values of, uh, you know, many orders of magnitude larger than, than, than what we can see to, to, to be able to, to, yeah. to see any, any trace of that. And second, I wanted to mention this uh, regarding energy conservation. Uh, first of all, uh, there is another example that I like to make very uh, often that has nothing to do with gravitational waves and I think illustrates the issue even more clearly, consider a universe that is filled with radiation. We know that radiation scales like energy density in radiation scales like the temperature to the fourth. So it scales like one over the scale, uh, one over a to the fourth, while the volume scales like a to the third. So energy in radiation, if you would try to compute energy as the product of volume times energy density, energy in radiation, clearly disappears in the cosmological setting uh, without going anywhere. Yeah. And finally, uh, I mean, there are no gravitational waves in, in that. Well, in the, yes, in that yes. Case, there are no the gravitational case. waves, but there is expansion. So yeah, gravitational yeah. waves okay. is, too, is too, yeah, I agree. I okay. agree with what you're saying. Okay. And, and, and finally, and here we have a slightly different uh, perspective with uh, Alejandro, but I put there for you, recent paper uh, we wrote with uh, other people uh, that the questions, uh, you know, and, and, and explores the degree to which we can really hope to hold to the notion of energy conservation, even con of conservation of energy momentum tensor, once you start considering, you know, quantum mechanics in its full extent, including resolving the, what to me is the elephant in the room, uh, which is the, the measurement problem. Uh, here with Alejandro, we don't have exactly, you know, perfectly coinciding views, but uh, okay, if you want another perspective on, on this issue, uh, I put a paper there in, in a message to everyone if, if anybody is interested. Uh, sorry for the propaganda, but I thought it would <laughs> clarify. Okay. <laughs> um, Daniel and Alec, can I ask you both a super speculative question? Um, how about some law about the conservation of information? How, do you know of anything like that? Have you ever thought about it? Yeah, he, here is one of the points where, where, where Alejandro and I diverge. I don't think there is any reason why there should be a conservation of information. In my view, there is simply, you know, we have used, we are very used to the fact that in dealing with small systems in quantum mechanics, it's enough to deal with the Schrodinger equation, and we know that that preserves, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's a completely deterministic evolution that allows you to recover the initial st the state at any time from the state at any other time. But from my point of view, the Schrodinger equation cannot be 
the full story of quantum mechanics once you start applying it to uh, large, you know, larger systems. There has to start being small deviations, which which may not become apparent when dealing with systems with very sm small number of degrees of freedom, but that will certainly become apparent in preventing, for example, Schrodinger cats or things of that sort. Uh, but as I, I said here, we and Alejandro, my, Alejandro and I, we don't see things 100%. Uh, um, Daniel, we don't see you. I don't know if it's on purpose or if you want to switch on your camera. Uh, you don't have to. In, here is in Mexico. I was in my pajamas. So no I, worries. No worries. <laughs> no, so, now I am. Now I am presentable. So, so <laughs> just to say to the rest that uh, Daniel, that he was a co-author in many of the papers that Alejandro was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. So you managed to do a lot of good work together, but uh, still uh, the loop quantum gravity philosophy and the from Alejandro and the collapse models philosophy from you survives in that um, yes because because the Daniel is very careful in saying that I, I I have a different viewpoint but I must say that I mean I respect the viewpoint of Daniel I'm not saying that I have arguments against it it's just that I like to explore I mean we have I am not as convinced about some things as, as Daniel might be and that's but that's a strength of our interaction also <laughs> as i am not as convinced i mean i, I wouldn't say, i mean i am very much motivated by loop quantum gravity but i think uh and this is the root of all my motivations but i one one cannot say that all this comes directly from loop quantum gravity it's motivated from my side by this but also from daniel's angle by different ideas that maybe I did not, obviously I did not uh, represent in my presentation. Uh, yeah. So yeah. The, we, we have a very healthy interaction, even though we don't have completely a, a point of view. My, my view about loop quantum gravity is that it's an interesting path for, for exploring ideas that may contain some ideas that are, that that will survive in the ultimate theory, uh, but uh, the same way that the Alejandro is more skeptical about the collapse theories and these things, I am uh, slightly more skeptical about, well, not only loop quantum gravity. To me, to me, my own philosophical view is that it would be almost a miracle, but that by just intellectual inspection and with very, very little clues, we would have we would come, you know, to the fundamental, we would just happen to pick on the fundamental theory of quantum gravity with very, very little guidance, you know. During the development of particle physics, we were helped by an astounding amount of information flowing all the time and, get, and helping guide us, you know, and, and many theoretical ideas we, we, we threw under the garbage and we don't learn about them because, you know, they were proven wrong. Uh, in, uh, but we had a lot of help in developing our current understanding of, let's say, this standard model of particle physics and 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 and, and in, in dealing with the quantum gravity, we don't have that fortune. We have very very little clues. So so yeah, and and this is the portion on which we agree. So that's why I mean. I, that's why I think it's so important to, exp we, we think it's so important to propose this type of phenomenological uh, approaches, which are speculative, certainly speculative, but that could open, you know, the field, I mean, the doors for, for some hints that could help us, you know, uh, advancing the construction of the theory. So something more than just theoretical thought and recipes of quantization. We might need that. I mean, quantum field theory, particle physics was like that. Quantum mechanics was like that. Without some feedback from reality, we wouldn't have done much. And so maybe, maybe there are many, there are so many mysteries in cosmology, right? Dark energy, dark matter, so many things we don't understand. So we we start seeing black holes now. I mean, detecting things coming from black holes, gravitational waves. So we should try to come up with ideas that could have observational consequences, that could 
they could be wrong and rule out by observations, but if we if we find something that is there, then that would be invaluable, invaluable, how do you say? Yeah. Of great value. <laughs> yeah, in that direction, I, I like to always quote uh, Sir Francis Bacon. He said uh, something that has guided me a lot, you know, which is uh, the following. Truth emerges more readily from error than from confusion. So you may make a proposal, be try to be very clear about it. It may be wrong, and then you will discover it's wrong, and you will have learned something. If you work in a way where you're, you have not made your ideas precise and are not you're careful to maintain self-consistency in your proposals and things of that sort, then you will not really, you know, learn any, uh, anything. Doesn't matter if your idea is is uh, you know you wouldn't have been you wouldn't have really explored your what you thought was was an idea worth exploring um yeah i guess we're more often wrong so uh yep. you more often than not learn that you're wrong if what you say is yeah, but from being but from being from being wrong if you are careful then you have learned a lesson so uh, yeah i mean uh, before closing the discussion i don't know if somebody else wants to say something but i wanted to insist a bit on on this um, uh to get your take daniel um i mean i have pretty much the same point of view as alejandro the intuitive part of there's a lot of degrees of freedom at the pre-domestic level because the plant skin is so small and what goes on over there, there's just going to be too much, uh, you know, capacity to, for information to go. So there is no reason why information would be lost. Uh, it's going to be stored in there. Um, do you, is there something, I mean, except from saying, uh, you know, maybe yes, maybe not. Is that what you're saying? Or is it that you simply do not think that there should be any conservation laws. You're asking me? Sorry. Yes. Me? Yeah. Yes. I don't. I, I don't think there should be any conservation laws. Okay. Exact, hundred percent conservation laws. I don't think there should be. If I may follow up with a question, Daniel, what do you think about the space-time singularities? Are they there in nature or not? No, I think there. I, I think we, you know, a singularity is clearly a situation in which, you know, uh, uh, our theories don't work. I don't know how to calculate with singularity, so it's obvious that the theory uh, doesn't work. So, to, this, to me, the singularity is an indication that you have reached a point where the, your theory is not longer valid, and you need a better theory. Uh, now, my point of view is that, uh, you know, the other extreme, GR must connect with that theory in a more or less smooth way where you know things that we take for you know that we we are used for gr to work with will start failing slowly slowly in different ways as you start approaching the regimes where where you know the new theory will take hold i don't know what is the nature of the new theory i suspect the new theory should involve quantum mechanics and gravitation, of course, so call it a theory of gravitation, but I also think it should solve, my point of view is, it, is I think it should also solve the, the measurement problem. So to me, these are the three elements that I try to bring together, but I certainly don't think there are, you know, singularities. And if, but, uh... if, if we manage to have a, you know, a good description of the world, the, should, the description shouldn't break anywhere, right? And well, we as have. We talk... Sorry, uh, as we talk about conservation of energy, we have uh, when we take it as true, we have discovered neutrino with this. Yeah, probably have discovered them. That's true. That's it was true. the only one which that, 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 uh... you know. As I said, things will not. I don't expect things to fail. You know, hundred. Yes. You know, immediately and in all situations. The, 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 you know, 
our theories. Newton's theory was extremely good for a long time. And you started finding small deviations in, you know, when you started doing a very, very, very high precision analysis and very, very, very high precision. In, in the paper I have put there, I will give you examples of situations where you will find it's hard to assume energy uh, is exactly conserved. Okay, at the point and the and the exact wording is exactly conserved, right? And and I gave you one one example, you know, a very simple example. You know, take a Einstein Einstein's closed universe, uh, expanding universe filled with radiation. You know, energy you, you will not be able to define any energy that is conserved. <clears throat> So, well, there is one that is conserved, but it's zero. It's, okay, so yeah, <laughs> the number zero is conserved, the number one is conserved, but have nothing to do with it. Uh, it's constraint, but, but of GR. Yeah, yeah. But again, we know, so GR, we know that GR cannot be the ultimate theory, right? So that's the point. GR is not the ultimate theory. Oh, we, I mean, serious. you guys are working. You guys are working in, in loop quantum gravity, which is supposed to reduce to GR under some co series of conditions. But in the in you know, in going from one to the other, you are going to start making certain assumptions, and under certain conditions, certain things will happen. And in this path, you know, all, all probably all the things that you recover when you recover. GR are going to start being lost when you call, when, when you start walking this path in the reverse direction. For, for Daniel? Yep. Um, I wanted to ask a question concerning the modeling. Most of Einstein's modeling was through thought experiments. So yep. um, it wasn't like he just, well, you could say that um, there were certain things known that he wasn't aware of at the time but most of his discoveries were based on thought experiments. So okay. the logic led to these discoveries. It wasn't like we discovered dark matter, or we discovered dark energy, um, and then we tweaked the models to fit the data because at that time, the cosmological constant came and went based on what, what Hubble had showed. So Einstein would, model was working with information that he had at the time. So you yep. would assume that if Einstein was living today, his GR would have never looked like it looked in 1919 because he would have known everything that we know now and he would have put it together in a different system. So we know that GR is limited, but is limited based on the information that Einstein had to work with in his logical mind of assessing things rather yes, than, I, okay, an experiment I, is done I, and then we assess the results and build I, a model to fit that. I, I am glad you brought this example precisely because it helps make my point precisely. This idea of working in, in a very careful and consistent way and looking for Gedanken experiments. The, 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 the paper I put there, it, you will find filled with Gedanken experiments, precisely trying, you know, following the, the lesson of Einstein, be consistent, define your notions, try to be precise about your notions, and then subjected to, you know, con specially designed conditions that will show you where those notions may start to fail and then re 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 refine your notion. So this is the, this is precisely this type of, 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 of logical analysis. And, and if you, if you, if you, if you recall the late part of Einstein's life, was devoted to trying to deal with quantum mechanics, which now yes, yes. we have we have learned that we simply put the problems of quant the conceptual problems on the of quantum mechanics under the rug, something that but, Einstein refused yeah, to do. But can I add something to that? When mm -hmm. you're talking about these logical experiments, that a logical um, analysis that he did, he always had an experiment that he was willing to test that theory where. He would actually, uh, even, even when he was wrong, he was correct because his paper, his EPR paper led to what we know with regards to entanglement. Right, yeah, right, they said he was right. wrong. Wait, 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 wait. I, can I say something? This is my talk and- uh, Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry. 
Sorry. Uh, I mean, you're going. Sorry, to... sorry, sorry. And I, have, and, and I have to go. Is, and I have to let go. me talk, please. I'm sorry. That is totally orthogonal to what I've been talking about. So it's very nice that, uh, well, there, there are different viewpoints, but this has nothing to do with what I described today. And if you want to discuss, let's discuss about what I present. Okay. Please. Can I do that? I somebody... Can I do that? Because you are talking about black holes. And most of the time, black holes do not occur as singular objects. They usually occur in binaries, just like you um, have neutron stars in binary. So what I'm trying to say is that when you're talking about a black hole, you could ask yourself, is it more of a quantum object or is it more of a just a macro classical object? If it is a quantum object, then one is spin up, one is spin down. If the spin is being driven down, and energy is being lost. If it's truly a quantum object, then the spin that relates to one of those objects, as it turns, it will affect the other one. What you're talking about. Um, yeah, excuse me. Okay, so. I, yeah. I, I am sorry, I apologize. I am sorry for, for, my, for my, and moreover, I, I need to go because I need to teach a class. So yes, so we're anyway past okay. the discussion time. Okay. Um, I think uh, we will be <laughs> editing out anyway. So just one and comment, we'll Marius. I, yes. I, in 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 the in the story of information that I yeah. basically did not talk about because we didn't have time and there were not many questions about it. Uh, the difference with Daniel is that I do assume that information is conserved, that there is a conservation law for information, but this is a very obvious one when you have when you assume unitarity i am not saying that this is the ultimate truth but people that discuss information often start from this assumption and i am taking this assumption as true i, I am not uh you know a believer of anything you know i mean we are trying to explore what reality is about under this assumption then the existence of microscopic degrees of freedoms could resolve the issue and there is a conservation law of information in the usual setup of quantum field theory, if you look at the density matrix that defines your state, uh, you can define the, the, the entropy of the density matrix that you have. If it's a pure state, it will be zero. If it's a mixed state, it will be something. And then time evolution, you know, given by some unitary operator, will tell you that this information doesn't change. That's in quantum field theory. In Quantum gravity, under some assumptions, like in the formation of a black hole and evaporation, you still have the possibility of talking about conservation of information because you have asymptotic regions and you have uh, an S matrix. Uh, you, you have some initial, uh, initial situation and you go to a final situation and you can phrase what you mean by information being conserved and unitarity implies that information should be conserved. Is the world unitary? Is information conserved? That's another question. It could be, as Daniel says, that there are things that do not preserve information and both, both, both ways are worth exploring. Okay. Um, <laughs> does anybody else want to say something? Or should we wrap up at this point? Yeah, so we're at two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, I think that's enough. And uh, thank you very much, Alejandro, okay. for okay. the patience well, and for your time. It was really, really nice, very interesting. Okay, and, so uh, thanks, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and uh, I hope soon we're going to have news about some things we're doing with Daniel in Lautaro. Sounds great. So the, um, <clears throat> the talk is going to be available on YouTube. Uh -huh. Okay. For anyone that wants to revisit. Bye I'm bye. Sorry, Alex. Alex. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you, Alex. Sorry, Alex. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Ciao, Daniel. Ciao. Perdón. <laughs> no te preocupes. <laughs> ciao, ciao.